um, the Ukrainian Catholic priest gave me at my aunt's church. Um, it's a little out of date. Uh, he doesn't really um, use the internet, so I think it's from like 19. And no, actually, I think it's from 2002 or 2003. Uh, but it, it's it's basically focused on the Ukrainian Catholic Church, um, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic, which is the biggest um, um, the biggest. Uh, portion of the, the Eastern Church, but I'm not going to talk about the Eastern Church um, quite yet. First, I'm going to talk about um, the, very briefly the division um, that occurred between Catholicism and what is now known as um, Orthodoxy. Um, so early, um, early on, tensions kind of were building between the West and the East. Um, Dating back to like the fourth, the, the fifth century, mid fifth century, um, the the Council of uh, I think it's Charlottesville was formed, and a few things came out of this council. One of which was um, this this idea that we have now that Christ has two natures; he's both man and God, and that was kind of something that was contested with, but but eventually agreed on. Um, but the other thing that came out of it was known as Canon Twenty Eight which asserted that the Sea of Constantinople was equal to the Sea of Rome, um, which doesn't really fly with us as Rome being sort of the inheritor of the Sea of, uh, of Peter. Um, but at this council, there were no papal representatives, so it was obviously, and why would they obvious, you know, why would they give credence to that? Um, so it was denied, and there were some fights, and it kind of passed over. Um, but this also kind of had to do with the, the po political shifts at the time. Um, Constantinople um, was moved, the, the Roman Empire moved its uh, capital out of Rome to Constantinople. So what you really had going on was kind of the old head of the empire, which was the seat of, of, of Rome, the Sea of Rome. And then you have the Sea of, of Constantinople, which is now also the political head of um, the Roman Empire, so it's easy to see how kind of power politics were at play here too. Um, and this was kind of so this this whole idea that that you know there were equal seas, that Rome wasn't the most important. It, it wasn't necessarily you know the chair of Peter that got to direct everything. This was quelled, and it was kind of. Um, Put away and it became dormant, but it was never really. Um, it was always there, um, and it rose up again uh, in 1858 when the Patriarch of Constantinople um, once again did the same thing. He denied that that Rome had authority to to tell him what to do or to tell other um, sees what to do. Um, and then, so so that is the, that was kind of the biggest issue with the Eastern Church and the Western Church, this idea of uh, papal authority. Uh, but there are also um, what might seem to some people as kind of specific theological issues, but they're fairly big. Um, and two of them um, had to do with the sinlessness of Mary um, and also um, the, the creed, um, and what I think is known in Latin as the addition of the filioque, which is what we say now when we're talking about the, the Holy Spirit, we say um, from the Father and the Son. Um, and this was a big issue with the Eastern Church because they had this very delicate sense of, of uh, the Holy Spirit, God, and, and Christ. Um, and, and this idea that for them it couldn't be from God and the Son, it had to be from God and through the Son. So it was a very specific issue that they couldn't agree on. Um, and very interestingly, St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas notes that there are, there are so many of these disputes. Um, they've gone over century and they still go on, obviously, because we haven't been united. Um, but he says that many of the things which sound well enough in Greek do not perhaps sound well enough in Latin. Hence the Latins and the Greeks professing the same faith do so with different words. So really what he says is that in many cases this just came down to a linguistic battle. And I'm not going to read the whole quote, but you know, basically 
you know, to, to do a kind of direct translation of Latin or vice versa, it doesn't quite, it doesn't quite um, do, do the idea justice. Um, so even though they were kind of believing the same things, many times it just happened to be in a, in kind of dumbing it down, but almost uh, a lack of good translation. Um, the other big issue was, as I said, the sinlessness of Mary. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this much, but obviously, the, as Catholics, we believe that she was born sinless, um, immaculately conceived. But the Eastern Church believes that though she lived without sin, she was capable of sin. So this is, again, something that's fairly big, but it, it divided people. Um, and the, so, so, so then we move two centuries later, and this is when the big things hap happen. At 1054, um, this is known as the Eastern Schism. Um, and this is when the Patriarch of Constantinople decided that he was going to force all the, the Latin churches in the Sea of Constantinople to use Greek usages. Um, and so some papal representatives were sent, um, and this guy, Cardinal uh, Humbert, uh, from France went there, but he didn't really get along too well with him. You know, the patriarch that he was rude uh, didn't address him properly. Then uh, Humpert went to uh, the emperor, they had a good time, and then, then Humpert made a big statement about Latin usages and why they were better. And then a Greek monk of, I don't remember his name, but he had some stature, he made a big criticism of the Latin church, uh, particularly celibacy. So then it was a huge thing, and then, to kind of top it all off, Humpert um, decides to excommunicate the Patriarch of Constantinople. Not only that, he kind of theatrically does it, and waits till uh, the liturgy is about to start, walks into the church, puts the papal letter of excommunication on the altar, and then walks out. Um, so after that, um, I think it, the patriarch was uh, Cerebrarius. Um, he then excommunicated the Pope once again. <laughs> De you know, once again denying that the See of, of Rome had any authority to do anything to him. Um, and so, pretty much after this point, it was kind of kaput. Um, and you know, thing, the, there was a Council of Lyon, and things were. Tried, they tried to do something, but they couldn't. And of course, even before that, um, it was worsened with the Fourth Crusade when um, they sacked Constantinople. So, you know, at, at that point, there was there was very little chance that they were going to get back together. Um, so now, knowing that history, what I'm going to talk about is what we now know as the Eastern Catholic Churches. So the Eastern Catholic Church, um, for the most part, is is. Um, composed of churches that were once out of communion with Rome, we decided that um, they're, they're, they wanted to, to enter that communion again. Um, but it, there's some exceptions, like the Maronite um, Catholics, they're Eastern Catholics, but they were never, uh, they never broke from Rome. So it's not, but for the most part, for example, the, this handout um, that you can look through, this details mostly uh, the reunification of the, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Um, so, um, so when these churches came back in, um, they were allowed to keep all their rituals, all the things that were special to them, although they, of course, had to say, you know, we believe in the, the uh, papal authority and, and the certain dogmas of the Catholic Church, they, they obviously accepted. Um, so I'm going to go through a few differences um, between um, the, uh, the, what we know as Roman Catholicism and then the Eastern Catholic Church. Um, so the, I, I'm actually going to read a, a little bit out of, this is my, my grandmother's prayer book, and she, was a, she spoke Ukrainian, um, and she obviously was a Ukrainian Catholic. Um, and the first thing which is kind of distinctive is the actual kind of design of most of the churches. Um, and it says here, um, and this is from 1950, so there's a lot of modern, more modernized uh, Ukrainian churches now, but, but not many. Um, 
the chief characteristic of the exterior of Ukrainian churches is, is the bulbous dome, kind of like the basilica, um, but it's generally even more pronounced. Um, and what you have, um, what, what you have in the altar, see when we look at the altar, we can see the whole sanctuary. We can see everything there, but what's very interesting about the, the Eastern church is that it's walled off. Um, and there are certain doors, there's a main door, there's a door for the deacon, um, and it, it separates you as if you're, it, basically it's a different room. Um, and it's most of the things that go on uh, except the main things in the altar are not seen to, to parishioners. Um, also, the priests face the altar for a, a majority of the time, um, and the idea, which it says, is there is kind of, instead of celebrating with people, um, leading people um, to Christ. Um, the, the, one of the big things, of course, is, you know, we have statues in the Roman Catholic Church um, versus the, the use of icons. Um, and another big thing um, in the Eastern uh, Church is that priests can marry, um, however, not if they're American, um, and only if they have done so before they're ordained. Um, the Roman Catholics, as we know, use the unleavened wafer, um, and the, I'm fairly certain that, that all of the Eastern Churches use a leavened piece of bread, and what they do is they actually, when, when you go up to have communion, um, you hold out your mouth like the older, um, you know, the more traditional way we do in the Roman Catholic Church, but they take that um, piece of bread and they dip it in the wine and with a spoon and then spoon it into your mouth. Um, so, it's, so the wine and the bread are, are taken together, you can't really have one or the other. Um, and, the, in the Eastern churches, um, prayers are, are, are sung and repeated uh, so much. Um, oftentimes things are done in threes, um, and I always thought that was because of the idea of the Trinity, and it may be, I wasn't actually, I've gotten so many different answers, even from Ukrainian Catholics. I think it actually goes back to a verse in the Old Testament, but it might have become kind of a way to, to represent the Trinity as well. Um, but I might be wrong on that, so. Um, but um, there's this kind of continuous back and forth of singing, like, and chanting from the priest and also the parishioners. Um, and this is something really interesting. And, and actually, when I've been in church, um, I was baptized the uh, Eastern Catholic. Um, and But I was raised mostly in the Roman church because once my parents moved away from Connecticut to Maine, there were no Eastern churches near us. Um, so I really, although I have a, a connection to the Eastern church, I understand Roman Catholicism much better. Um, and as I've been back, um, there's this really interesting thing um, about the sign of the cross. Um, and, and I've noticed that a lot of the older Ukrainian Catholics still do this, and some of the younger ones, but I have noticed it's not completely standardized. So uh, this comes from my grandmother's uh, prayer book. So the, the sign of the cross, so often made during the, the divine uh, liturgy uh, by the Byzantine rite, um, is made uh, by joining the three fingers of the right hand. Um, and so, and, and the idea is again to express the Trinity, that they're one and you can't separate them. Um, and then it's not done, um, it's done the opposite way of, um, so they cross themselves from the, and it's not a big deal to us, but, but they do it differently. Um, they do it from the right to the left versus the left to the right. Um, and the sacraments, um, baptism, uh, when I was baptized, I was immersed in total water. I think maybe some Roman Catholic churches do that, but I think most um, sprinkle it on. Um, and I was confirmed at the same time. Um, so I didn't have to go through confirmation at all. It was just I was in the church and I was confirmed with baptism. Um, so those are the major differences. And I think I'll end with um, just kind of something that I've been thinking about as I've been looking into the Eastern Church. Um, and Brian kind of touched on this. Um, the, the precedence that the, the Roman Church gives to, to reason 
um, and that is, is slightly different uh, even in the Eastern Church today. Um, this idea that, you know, uh, in Roman Catholicism, that we can reason God, that we can, that we can use our mind to, to, to grasp notions of Him. Obviously, we need revelation and we need all these things, but, but we, can, we can do some of the work by ourselves. Going back to orthodoxy, orthodoxy totally denies this. Um, it says that you can, what you can know of God is only through revelation, and, and you can't. Reason is is our, our reason being humans. We, we couldn't even begin to contemplate um, the idea of God without actually being given something from God. Um, and so, in in orthodoxy, there's almost this kind of like Socratic notion of God, where it's like you you we know less of God than we know of Him. And what we kind of worship to a degree is, 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 is that. Um, there's so much we cannot reason of Him. There's so much we can't conceive. And this is in Catholicism too, but it's not emphasized really. Um, and with Catholicism, you have this strong reasoning aspect. I mean, you see that in Augustine and, and, and Thomas Aquinas. Um, and so in the Eastern churches, it seems to me, when they came back into the communion with Rome, they obviously um, embraced a lot of those ideas. Um, but at the same time, they kind of kept those more mystical aspects. Um, and I think the two things that, that really um, speak to me in that manner are the icons and the chanting. Um, the chanting in particular because, you know, I, I'll, I've often brought my Roman Catholic friends to services when I'm visiting my aunt or something. Um, and, and they go into the the ceremony, and my wife, when, when, when a relative of mine passed away, she went into it um, thinking it was kind of odd at first because there was all this chant and everything was sung uh, three times, people sang it back, and kind of odd at first, but then, you know, slowly kind of just totally lost, you know, just what are we doing, why are we doing it? Um, and I think just the act of, of, of doing so much singing, um, tends to get you out of this, it, it brings in a part of you that, that isn't reason. Um, and you almost have to give over to, to, to almost a, a loss of control, which I think is really emphasized in the Orthodox Church. Um, and I think the Eastern churches, at least the ones that I grew up in um, and have been back to, really choose emphasis. So I, so I would say that, um, that's one very specific thing that, that I appreciate um, in the Eastern Church. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions?